also a local leader here at this Portage County chapter. I also represent Congressional District 3 on the State Board for our Wisconsin Revolution. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, restroom facilities are immediately out the store to the right, um, and then non gender bathrooms are directly above us, one floor up. Um, so please feel free to use those if you need to take a break. Um, I would also like to introduce, introduce I'm sorry, Mike Lisa, um, who will be doing a formal welcome to Mayor Stevens Point. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Candidates, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, our Wisconsin Revolution, for putting this on, because this is a venue that doesn't always happen, uh, where we get to meet and just talk to uh, so many candidates that are going to be very important in November. Uh, I was just next door talking about some of the reasons why we need something changed in November, and that is the continued cuts to the university, which happens to be a vital part of our community. The continued cuts cannot happen. You keep cutting things and cutting things and cutting things, and eventually you're going to have problems. So that's one of the reasons I think we need some change in November. Um, the other one is speaking as mayor. The continued cuts to shared revenue, the continued defunding of vital programs, and Katrina is here, thank you for coming. She knows that very well. We have a luxury in central Wisconsin to have a very uh, like-minded representative, which is the way government should be run. So it's never a problem to convince our representative um, what we need to, to lobby for here in Stevens Point. So I uh, thank you. We have a really good crowd. I was getting nervous for a while because it hadn't filled up, but now I don't think there's many empty seats, if at all. I know there's a few people standing, so um, thank you all very much for coming. Welcome, and best of luck to all of our candidates. Hello, everybody. How's Stephen Point doing today? All right, so my name is Bobby Maldonado and I'm the Wisconsin's Choice uh, field organizer. And essentially what Wisconsin Choice is, campaign is, is OWR, our Wisconsin Revolution, and well, we're Wisconsin Working Families Party. It's a joint campaign, and essentially our job is to find the next progressive champion. Are you guys ready for the next progressive yes. champion? Yes. Are you guys ready to end Scott Walker's year? Yes. So real quick, I'm going to just go through the format. Um, essentially, we're going to have a group of experts. Uh, the experts will ask, ask uh, each candidate a question, uh, two minutes apiece, and they get to respond for uh, two minutes. And then the experts follow up with two uh, follow-up questions to the candidates, and each candidate will have a chance to answer those follow-up questions. One follow-up question. Yeah, only a couple of candidates get to answer the questions. Um, so also I just wanted to say that uh, Senator Weinhoff couldn't make it tonight. Uh, she had a loss in the family. So we will be, we will keep her in our thoughts. Okay. And uh, the, can the, uh, the candidates will have one minute to do a quick introduction. And we can start with Michelle Doolin. on the outside looking in going, what the heck is going on? I'm a citizen candidate, and I'm 100% grassroots funded. I am taking no special interest outside money whatsoever, because I'm going to represent the people, not organizations. Because you're either fighting for democracy or you're not. So has anybody heard about, does anybody know what hangry is? Like the term hangry, like you're not rational, you can't think, and you're really kind of in it for yourself, right? And that's kind of how I like in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is hangry right now. And until we get basic needs met, which is reality, nothing else is gonna be solved. 
So the reality is you cannot live in Wisconsin on low wages. You just can't. And the reality is that health care for all is everywhere in the developed world but here. And there's no excuse for that. I'm the candidate of the future. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Gronick. Those are great, bright lights. Wow. So if I can see you, let me just ask, who out there thinks politics as usual is working? Anyone? Raise your hand. I had one last week. OK, so I don't think anybody does. So we have to stop doing the same things and expecting different results. I'm the guy in the race that never imagined in a million years that I would ever run for public office, let alone for governor. I spent my entire 35 years working to help struggling companies solve problems, put a plan together, grow on those strengths, and create good paying jobs. That's what I did. I think those, those same skills are going to come in kind of handy here. I will say just briefly, I was next door, and I listened to two hours, which was a great listening session, in an environment where people are trying to take out the basics of the university system here in Stevens Point that make no sense. You know, ask yourself a very simple question. When you went to go for a job, was it important that you knew how to actually write and read and communicate? Let's not take out our humanities. Hi, I'm Bob Harlow. I'm running for governor because I believe in a democracy not only of votes, but of skills and ideas. That's the way we can achieve real equal opportunity in Wisconsin. We need to put behind the days when only a privileged few had an opportunity to get the best education, to get the skills needed to compete in the global economy. We need to give that opportunity to every Wisconsinite. I have deep roots in this state. I'm a third generation Wisconsinite. My family growing up had a woodworking business that still does. And three of my grandparents were professors at our University of Wisconsin-Madison. I got a degree in physics from Stanford. I worked uh, in the Bay Area in tech. And my whole life, I have brought people together to solve complicated problems and achieve results. I will be ready on day one to do that as governor of Wisconsin. And we'll achieve results for the people of Wisconsin. Hi, I'm Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Mike McCabe. I, uh, I am the one candidate in the race who was born and raised on a farm. Grew up on a dairy farm in Clark County, a little bit north and west of here. Uh, my life's work was spent as an independent watchdog until running for governor. I have spent my adult life seeking to expose and break the grip of big money influence in politics. I'm running for governor because we have a government that works extraordinarily well for those at the very top, for a wealthy and well-connected few, but is failing regular people. My goal as governor is to get regular people back in the driver's seat of our government so that your interests can be represented in state policy, so that your values will be reflected in the actions of our state government. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Are we fired up? Yes. That's better. My name is Malin Mitchell. I'm a firefighter from the city of Madison. I've been on the job there for 21 years. I got to meet a lot of you when I ran for lieutenant governor in 2012. Uh, the recall election, we came up a little bit short. But as I said back then, I'll say it now, we did not quit, and I'm not going to quit. So we are back, and I'm back. Um, I reside in Madison. Like I said, I'm a firefighter there. My wife's a flight attendant for Delta. Otherwise, she'd love to be here as well. Last time I was actually on this campus, before I ran for lieutenant governor in the recall, I was here visiting with my daughter, who actually chose Oshkosh. Don't hold that against me. But my daughter's a freshman at UW Oshkosh. I was born in Milwaukee. I grew up in Delavan, Wisconsin. For those of you that don't know, Governor Walker actually grew up in Delavan, Wisconsin as well. It's a small town south of Madison, about an hour south of Madison. 30 minutes west of Janesville, east of Janesville. And me and Governor Walker actually went to the same high school. But obviously we took some different classes. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, for the last 25 years, Governor Walker has been running for office. For the last 21 years, I've been serving my community as a firefighter. I love to have your vote. I look forward to having a conversation with you. Thanks.
My name is Kelda Royes, and I am running for governor because I want to restore opportunity and fairness to Wisconsin. I want to make our state the very best place to raise a family and the best place to grow a business. I was born in Marshfield, not too far from here, and grew up a little bit in Taylor, Taylor County and mostly in Dane County. I'm a lawyer by training, a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Schools. I spent four years traveling the state as executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin, fighting on the front lines for access to health care, including reproductive health care. I spent two terms in the state assembly, working to expand access to badger care and fighting Scott Walker's radical agenda. And for the last five years, I've been an entrepreneur and a small business owner. I know what we need to help create good paying jobs in this state and address the income inequality. I've done it in my own life. I've had that opportunity, and I want to make sure every single person in Wisconsin has the opportunity to do so. I look forward to hearing your questions, and I thank you very much for being here. I hope I can earn your vote on August 14th and again on November 6th. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Paul Soglin, and I can tell you if I'm your governor, I won't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. On February 12th, 2011, before Valentine's Day, I was there with the graduate students marching from the campus to the state capitol to oppose Act 10. The next day I put out a statement and I was there every single day through the first week of April when I was elected mayor. I want to point out, I want to point out that when we lost the battle in the courts on Act 10, the city of Madison led the way adopting a handbook to codify the contracts with our labor organizations. I want to point out that we are now in the second of three years in 2019. Every city employee is going to start with a minimum wage of $15 an hour. I want to point out that when Foxconn took place, I said not only is it a horrible deal, but it's going to set the bar for the next one, and we're not going to do it no matter how badly we need Kimberly Clark. Hi folks, I'm Dana Watts. I represent Eau Claire in the state legislature. For 32 years, I've stood in the courtroom fighting against powerful, wealthy special interest groups and insurance companies and, and corporations on behalf of regular folks in the middle class, people trying to get into the middle class. You see, I was raised in Eau Claire. I was raised by, my mom was a, a public school teacher and they taught me the values of Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, we care for each other. And the vision I hold for Wisconsin is a Wisconsin that has badger care for all. A Wisconsin that has a clean environment, invests in a, clean, in, a, in a renewable environment industry, makes sure that there's justice in the economic workplace, $15 an hour. We bring back collective bargaining. We roll back these right to work laws and the like. And we don't have any more corporate welfare. I've been fighting Foxconn to their face. I'm on the Wisconsin Economic Development Board. This is wrong. It's not investing in our people. I think it's time to invest in Wisconsin's people. That's why I'm running for governor. I'm Ben Miller. Uh, I was asked first to give a little introduction of myself, who I am, but that really probably requires a psychoanalyst. Uh, I've, been here a, I've been here a long time. I'm a political scientist. Uh, I think I came when the campus opened in the late 1800s. Uh, but anyway, I do write the chapter on the governor and the Wisconsin Governor of Politics book and the local government chapter as well. I, my, one of my areas is health care, and that's what I was asked to, to ask the question. I'm also the uh, political science uh, analyst for the Wall Street Journal uh, as well. But let me ask the, the questions. I don't spend more time on this. Uh, Governor Walker recommended that the state workers be insured through a state of Wisconsin self-insurance plan, which is essentially a public plan. I don't know if you recognize that. This legislature turned this down. Would you first press for the Governor Walker's plan for self-insurance plan for state workers, which, which is what he did, and second, would you allow this plan to be open to all state residents essentially creating a state public option. Hello. 
Hello. There we go. All right. You know, I, I love how at the 11th hour, Governor Walker is going, yeah, we're going to give a public option. But state workers' wages were artificially lower with better benefits. So then if they're buying into their own insurance, I mean, let's cut the, let's cut the take home pay of the largest employer in the state of Wisconsin and see how that affects small businesses in Wisconsin, right? It's not about, I support a public option. I live in that reality. I do. And I support a public option that is not just available, but affordable. Yeah, it's available, but I'm an MS patient. Trust me, I have insurance and I'm glad for it, but my health care is not affordable. And I'm, I'm 44 years old. I have a long time to live. So I would support a public option, just not the way that Walker would bid. Hi, again, I'm Andy Gronick. I want to be your governor. So isn't it amazing that we have a governor that basically goes out and attacks the Affordable Care Act and then comes back with what he calls the Health Care Stability Act. This is not a person that cares about health care for all. This is a guy that's trying to run for re-election after being elected time and time again by special interests. I do believe health care is a right. I do believe that we should not have two classes of people in the state of Wisconsin. One, that if they get sick, they don't have to worry about getting better, and the other, if they get sick, they could lose their life or their life savings. That makes no sense. I do think health care for all should reside on the federal side, but I think Congress has been working pretty hard to destabilize that, and what happens when that happens? Think about it from a real terms of the state of Wisconsin. By destabilizing ACA, they are destabilizing every rural hospital in the state of Wisconsin. They will be first to go. What happens when that happens? Well, we have great health care in this state that's now gone. All those jobs are gone. All of what those jobs mean to the economy are gone. And those small towns, the fabric of the state of Wisconsin, shrinks and it goes away. That's exactly what happens. So as your governor, if it's pushed back to the state of Wisconsin, I'll look for real and practical solutions to make sure that health care is available to all. But I want to be very careful to say that expanding Badger Care as a public option, while I would absolutely look at that as an option, we have to make sure that it works both for the people who need health care and for the people who are supplying health care. This is an incredibly, incredibly complex issue. I think our president, President Trump, already made the mistake of assuming health care was simple. I won't assume it's simple. I'll bring people to the table People who understand healthcare from every different perspective. That's patients, nurses, doctors, that's healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies, everybody that can afford a smart and well informed part of that solution, and we'll make sure everybody in this state has affordable access to healthcare. What I believe in for healthcare is a system that achieves a very high quality of care, that achieves very low cost for every Wisconsinite, for every American. Now in this country, we have been held up uh, by the fact that uh, industry is so close to politicians in Congress that there is so much say of uh, lobbyists for health insurance companies, for drug companies, and as a result, you have uh, relationships between governments and between these companies uh, that are driving up costs, that are making it harder for Americans to get care. I think a case in point is what Governor Walker is proposing, where he's going to give direct payments to health insurance companies to cover some of their uh, unexpected high costs. And what that's going to do is funnel a lot of public money into a system that is not held accountable for delivering high quality care, into a system that is not held accountable for delivering efficient care, merely a system where uh, there is this close personal relationship between Governor Walker and these industries. I want to see transparency in healthcare. I want to see room for innovation. I want to see uh, laws that don't oblige the healthcare system to have a lot of vertical integration, to have uh, a murky system where it's unclear why healthcare costs are so high or what exactly is being built for. I want to see 
a competition and innovation all throughout healthcare that's going to bring down the cost of healthcare for Wisconsinites. And we also need to have a system where if research on drugs comes out of public universities, as a lot comes out of the University of Wisconsin, there's a string on that. That research should serve the public good, not just be another subsidy to private companies. So if public money is funding research into drugs, we need to hold a string on that research and make sure that the benefits of that actually enter the public domain and don't just make profits for private companies that didn't want to fund that research themselves. I want all of Wisconsin and all of America to have civilized medicine. I, I think we should take Medicare and Medicaid and other elements of the federal system, pull them all together, call it AmeriCare and make every American eligible. That's the federal solution, the national solution we eventually need to get to in this country, to have civilized medicine. But I also want Wisconsin to set an example for the nation to follow. I want us to be a leader that the nation follows. And I think three steps need to be taken. First of all, we need to take the federal Medicaid expansion money that was turned down. That was a horrible mistake to turn away that money. We should take that money and make that repair available to more people by doing that. Second thing, we should do what some states have done and Wisconsin neglected to do, and that is set up a state insurance exchange in Wisconsin. And then, the third step that we should take is making Badger Care a public option and put it on that insurance exchange and giving people an opportunity to go on that, mar private, on, on that insurance marketplace and have an option that the latest figures say is 38% less expensive than what you find out there on the private insurance market and it's better, higher quality insurance. Badger Care should be there for all Badgers. Um, I will answer your question first. Um, you asked about self-insurance and what Governor Walker was going to do with that plan. Essentially what Governor Walker was going to do was, was going to be detrimental to the state plan. As a firefighter, my job is when I take my turn off coat off, I actually go and, and, and work for hours, wages, working conditions for my members. The city of Madison is actually in the state plan in a municipal provision. The self-funding of the state health plan would have rolled premiums up. And the best thing about the state insurance, if you all don't know, is that they have to compete. Group Health, Unity, um, Physicians Plus, Merit, they all have to compete against each other, which in turn lowers premiums, lowers co-pays, lowers deductibles. So the self-insurance, that, that, that plan, I would say no. I would, I would not be okay with that. I think the plan we currently have is good. Now, going further, we should have taken the Medicaid dollars in our state. That would insure about 84,000, another 84,700 Wisconsinites. We have about 300,000 Wisconsinites in the state right now that don't have any insurance whatsoever. We can do better than that. There should never be a time where a child does not go to the hospital because their parents can't afford it. My mother's a diabetic. There should never be a time where a senior has to choose between actually getting their prescription drugs filled or paying their rent or their mortgage. So we can do so much better. I'm all for Medicare for all, single payer, whatever you want to call it. We need to make Badger Care a public option for everybody to get in. We need to lift the cap so that everyone has health care. That is a huge, huge economic driver for our state. There should never be someone that's just one sickness away from, bank, from being bankrupt. And we can do better in our state. So I would keep the state plan as it is, monitor it. And I, I'm not for self-insurance of the state plan because they are, the, the other groups do compete against each other right now, and what Governor Walker was doing, and what Governor Walker always does. Governor, do Governor Walker does what's right for Governor Walker when it's right for Governor Walker. That's when he does what's quote unquote the right thing. And there was no, there was no public option to self-funding of the state plan, by the way. Not that you said that. There, there <laughs> Professor Miller, I think that this room understands that Governor Walker has no credibility when it comes to health care. His self-insurance scheme is one that I looked at very skeptically, even though I think it can work well for employers of goodwill in the private sector. Uh, I think it is of great concern to state employees and other public employees who are covered under that plan. Um, we should not be allowing politicians the ability to meddle so directly in our health care. Um, especially when we see what they have done. Um, 
what their track record is. They, they are not acting in good faith. I think we should have a system that covers everybody. I've been a long time supporter of single payer system that covers everybody. It is unacceptable that in the, the most uh, wealthy nation in the world, there are people who can't go to the doctor or go bankrupt because they have an accident or an illness. I think we all agree on that. Um, my plan for health care is available on my website, caldifergovernor.com. I would accept the Medicaid expansion uh, dollars that would help ensure more Wisconsinites. I would set up a state exchange under the Affordable Care Act and make Badger Care a public option that people could buy into. And I know that this is going to unleash economic activity in our state. We, so much we talk about health care like it's in a silo. But it is absolutely connected to people's freedom to be able to start a business or go work for a small business and to allow companies like mine that provide the majority of net new jobs in our society to actually be able to compete. Um, if we're interested in having a vibrant economy where young people, people my age, Generation X and younger, want to live in Wisconsin, we need to make it more possible for them to do so. And guaranteeing access to health care is one way to do that. We need to make sure that we're expanding our public health infrastructure, that people in every corner of the state have access to mental health care, that we can address the opioid crisis, not with the criminal justice system, but with the health care system. There's so much we can do with health care in the state, but destroying the good public insurance that state employees have is not one of them. Thank you. I agree with everything that's been said, and I agree with everything that Dane is going to say. <laughs> Uh, to answer the question directly, absolutely not. About every decade since I was 12 years old, I've looked at self-insurance for public employment, and it just simply does not work. I think we've got to understand a couple of things in this discussion as we move towards single payer. One, it is critical that when we talk health insurance that we talk about behavior health and the treatment of behavior health, and that we also deal uh, with, with the challenges involved with substance abuse. That has got to be part of the discussion. Also, if you ask a teacher, what is the greatest impediment to a child learning today in the classroom? It is going to be nutrition. And so dealing with hunger and dealing with the availability of food has got to involve our discussion uh, with, with health. I want to leave you with one other thought. As we deal with this crisis, there are companies coming into our state right now who are designed to set up specific private hospitals and all they are interested in doing is picking the cream of the crop. Those with the best insurance, they are going to turn away the people without it and that means that our existing local providers are going to lose those prime patients and still have to deal with treating the folks who don't have financial resources. We have to address that question and it gets to the question of cost. It's not just insurance. Healthcare in this country is too expensive. We have to take on the pharmaceuticals, and as much as I dearly love our hospitals in, in Madison, and they've done a wonderful job in dealing with me from one end to the other, <coughs> we've got to get them to understand that they have to pull in their costs, they're gonna to have to be more aggressive, along with the governor, in dealing with the federal government in terms of reimbursement so we don't get screwed and we get the same funds back as Florida. It's one end of the other, um, I, uh, I very much think that health care is probably one of the most important issues in this, in this uh, election. I, I'm in this race due in large part to health care. I remember recently I had couple of clients, Bruce and Diane. Bruce and Diane, they did the right thing through their whole lives. They were dairy farmers. They worked, they worked their tails off. And then one day, their youngest son turned 18. And a few months after that, um, Diane came down with, uh, di was diagnosed with diabetes. And a few months after that, one of her legs had to be amputated. They had no insurance at that time, so they ended up selling their farm and going to work on the farm that they had owned for 30 years as hourly fee employees. Later, Bruce was in a terrible accident. Again, no insurance. That's when I met these folks during my practice. I've been a trial lawyer for 32 years. This is why I'm in this race. And in terms of, of health insurance, absolutely <coughs> we need to make darn sure 
that as many people in this state are, are given, are, get health insurance as, as humanly possible. I think there should be health insurance for all. Absolutely. We're going to take the Medicaid money, we're going to have Badger Care, um, expand Badger Care to a buy-in system, and we've got to make sure that we have health care for everyone. Now there's lots of questions about self-insurance. Is this going to be an ERISA plan? Or is it a non-ERISA plan? And exactly, normally, uh, normally governmental policies are non-ERISA. Um, so there's, there's a lot of technical issues involved in this. And even with Badger Care and Medicaid expansion, you have to seek a federal waiver to get it. So this is a battle that's going to be waged, waged here and in Washington as well. But we have to be prepared because the way the Republicans are working in Washington, they're sabotaging the ACA. And pretty soon we won't have an ACA. And we've got to make sure we have viable health insurance for all the people in this state. What is more important is health insurance and right after that, education in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, which candidate? Um, I'll ask it to Mike. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions dealing with health care related to the insurance is the cost. And Wisconsin at one time had a certificate of need. Uh, many states that still have it, Wisconsin dropped it. Right now, Wisconsin remains in the building room among various uh, facilities. Would you reinstitute a certificate of need in Wisconsin so you don't have duplicative uh, facilities in the same community? I am definitely open to that. I, I think we've got to get back to, to serious state oversight of our whole health care system so that we don't have a duplication of service and so that we're also not leaving certain communities in this state, particularly in rural areas, without access to, to nearby medical care. All, all of that has to be considered. And then there's another issue that, that ties to this. And that has to do with Medicaid reimbursement rate. And I am open to increasing Medicaid reimbursement rate, but only if there is far more transparency when it comes to cost. So we not only have to make sure that there's not duplication of service and that there is access to service regardless of where you live in Wisconsin, but then we also have to demand far more openness and transparency when it comes to the actual cost. If we're going we're to reimburse medical care at a higher rate for Medicaid, we need to know what the actual cost is. And that, that has to be way more open than it currently is uh, here in Wisconsin and across the country. Mr. Mitchell, uh, on a similar note, uh, Wisconsin, uh, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, Anytime insurance companies want to raise uh, their cost more than, I think it's 10%, the insurance commissioner has to review that. And it depends on state law whether the insurance commissioner has to okay any increase. Would you institute this in Wisconsin, the, where they have to give it a, uh, an okay, just like the Public Service Commission? I would say we need to, we need to make sure that we regulate um, the insurance costs when it comes to the ACA. Um, you look at what happened with the federal government. They're trying to essentially um, have the ACA crumble because actually having the mandate where everyone has to have health care is what keeps everyone at the top or those that are a little older among us to be able to have affordable health care. We take those healthy folks at the bottom and they're not in the plan in the ACA, that's going to drive up costs. And when you drive up costs, it's going to be not affordable. So when they, they couldn't repeal the, the ACA or the Affordable Care Act at the federal level, so what they do is say, well, we'll make it crumble on its own weight by taking out the, the, those who are healthy among us. We need to get back to make sure we take care of all Wisconsinites. You know, you'll hear a lot of people on the far right, not, not this right, but my, <laughs> maybe some of them too, I don't know, just kidding, just kidding. Just kidding. But those on the far right, Republicans, I'll just say it, they'll say that we need access to health care. And, and Mike's right, we, we have rural areas where people have no health care. And they, they, they don't even have the access to health care. They've got to drive miles and miles, hours, just to get prenatal visits or to get actually adequate health care. Well, access to health care is nothing because we all in this room have access to buy a Porsche, right? We have the access. We can go down the road, we can go to the dealer, and we can actually get access, get a loan to buy a Porsche. But can we afford a Porsche? Most of us, Most of us can't. So having access is one thing, but actually having affordable, adequate health care is another. So the state needs to do everything they can. And we can do a whole heck, hell of a lot 
to make sure all 300,000 folks that don't have health care have it, and those that actually have health care now to make sure it's affordable. <laughs> Ms. Royce, uh, in, in Wisconsin had a very successful program, and that program that program was uh, regulating rates of hospitals. We had a rate review, review commission. Actually, we had it twice, and the second time, Tommy Thompson didn't appoint the commissioners, and it sort of petered out. Uh, but it was a model program, and it's written out for all around the country. Would you bring back a hospital rate commission? Rate you know, review. Wisconsin used to be a leader in a lot of things, not just rate review. I think that's a, a great idea. We need to have some public oversight of hospital rates, insurance rates as well, just like we do with energy rates, um, and make sure that these companies that are serving essential public functions um, are doing so under public oversight. Um, I also think it, uh, in terms of the cost of health care, we need to look at the medical loss ratio. This was one of the, perhaps the most important aspects of the Affordable Care Act, which said that uh, insurance companies have to spend a certain amount of the premium dollars that they take in on actually providing health care to people. So if you're taking all this premium money, you actually have to spend a certain percentage of it on health care and not just um, golden parachutes for your executives and um, trips to Vegas. And we need to increase that medical loss ratio over time to help health insurance companies become more efficient, to lower the cost of health care over time, and to make sure that we're actually getting the service that we need. Thank you. several years with United to Amend, and before that with Move to Amend, so my thing is money and politics. And I'm extremely passionate about it, and that's what we're going to talk about. I'm Mike Walnick. I'm a uh, retired member of the Sociology in the School of Education faculties at UW-Madison. Like Al, uh, money and politics has been a passion for me since the United to uh, United to Amend, since Citizens United, and I've been working with Al and others on that issue, and now with OWR on that issue. You all know that money in politics is the root of all, I want to say all evil, but it told me I should say all problems, uh, <laughs> since it has effectively turned our republic from a democracy into an oligarchy, and I don't know if anybody in this room can challenge that statement. However, we also understand that your opponent is funded by a lot of big money, which will make it difficult for you to compete, no matter who comes out of this. What is your plan for funding your campaign, and how will it make sure that no one will be put in a position of taking campaign donations from big money interests going forward? And I think we're starting with Mr. Harlow. I believe that the biggest problem we face as a nation is low voter turnout. And uh, it's right in the Republican playbook. How do you win an election if you're a Republican? How do you take a state like Wisconsin with a progressive tradition and turn Wisconsin into a reliable seat for Republicans? And the way you do it is to get voter turnout down, to have targeted demographic filters like voter ID laws that prevent uh, people who uh, have a different view than yours from getting to the polls and voting. Uh, we need to get voter turnout up. And as governor, I, this will be a priority of mine. How can we strike down barriers to voting, like voter ID laws? How can we increase access to, to polling stations, implement vote by mail, uh, have more early voting, and have public outreach campaigns. Uh, if Scott Walker can go to Chicago and spend $7 million 
trying to do recruitment for Foxconn, you'd imagine that the government of Wisconsin can spend $7 million in the last week before an election on publicity, that there's an election coming up on Tuesday. Make sure you get out and vote. We need to make sure that our public officials are held accountable to the will of the people of Wisconsin and low voter turnout is the reason that they are currently not being able to. Now don't get me wrong, there are other problems. Dark money in politics is a huge problem. Uh, the details of our campaign finance laws, also a problem, who is influencing these campaigns. But I think that misinformation can be effective, but it's much less effective if we have high voter turnout and make sure that the percentage of people you can sway with uh, NRA uh, phone call or mailer is small compared to the size of the electorate. Thank you. There is a cancer growing in the body of democracy. It affects every issue we care about. We will never get clean air or clean water from dirty politics. We will never get living wages from a dying democracy. We will never get health care from a sick political system. We will never get anything more than thoughts and prayers after each new mass shooting, as long as elected officials are paid to not give anything except thoughts and prayers. We have to cut that cancer out of the body of democracy. I have spent most of my adult life, decades of my adult life, seeking to expose and break the grip of big money influence in politics. It is what sets me apart from all the other candidates in this race. That has been my mission, and it will remain my mission, is to free our government from the clutches of cronyism and corruption and legal bribery. And Scott Walker will not be beaten with money. He will have vastly more than anyone. No candidate up here raised even close to a tenth of what Scott Walker just got ra done raising in, 20, in 2017. All of us combined didn't raise a third. We will beat him, not with money, he'll have vastly more than anyone. We have to beat him with people power, with grassroots organizing, with vision, with, with an inspiring vision of what Wisconsin has the potential to become and how we reach that potential. That's how we will beat Scott Walker. And it has to start with leadership by example. Legally, we can take $20,000 checks from individuals and $86,000 checks from political action committees. I consider those kinds of donations to be legal bribes. And I think in your hearts, you know that that's what they are. And they leave us with elected officials who do the bidding of those people who write those kinds of checks. And what I can tell you about those people, all of my experience has taught me, what they want our government to do is vastly different than what you want our government to do. We have to lead by example and say no to legal bribery in Wisconsin. You know, if, if this election is about money, then we're right. We, we all lose. Um, this election has to be about people. And it has to be about actually putting people over money, uh, people over bad politics, and people even over party. Um, quite frankly, we have to make sure that we change what Governor Walker has put in place. Governor Walker has done things that have gone really under the radar because there's been so many bad things happening. Like, for instance, the Government Accountability Board, which was actually put in place to try to keep our elections clean and moral and ethical, was actually taken away. So we no longer have a Government Accountability Board, a government watchdog, a nonpartisan watchdog to look at what's happened with our elections. We can actually, they, they double all the contribution limits. We can take $20,000 from one single donor. We can take $86,000 from one pack. Governor Walker has doubled all that. That's for them. That's to help them. They have the bigger donors than all of us. They have lobbyists that actually go into the Capitol. Now, the lobbyists can't give money while they're in session, but as soon as they're out of session, the lobbyists have a window where they can also give the $20,000. Well, they, they can also push the, the people they represent and the PACs they represent to certain candidates. There used to be a wall up where independent interest groups couldn't actually work with the candidate. Now they, they've lowered and they, they, they've eased back the wall, where the wall is still up, sort of, but now you can see through it. So now you can actually work somewhat with the independent group. You can't coordinate, but you can work, you can know what they're doing, and you can kind of talk and see, well, if you guys are doing a lift drop here, well, maybe we won't touch that turf or that area. So there are things that we need to do.
the government accountability board we need to bring, bring back. We need to make sure that we lower all the restrictions that are given in campaign donations. We need to get the lobbyists out of being able to give any money actually to, 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 to uh, elected officials. But in order to do any of this stuff, here's what we have to do. We have to actually win. We have to actually win an election. And that's why I'm running. We can talk about all these things and there's too much money in politics. I totally agree. But if we don't win, we're just whistling dicks. We're just talking. We have to win this election. It is key. I support full public financing of elections. That is the only way that we are going to be able to compete with big money. When I was in the legislature, I supported legislation to end Citizens United. I have fought against all restrictions on making it harder for people to vote and specifically targeting young voters, voters of color, and seniors. We have to do all these things if we're going to engage people in democracy and actually make it possible to hold Republicans accountable for their terrible policies. They've done everything to insulate themselves from gerrymandering themselves into these safe seats that even when Democrats win more votes, they still end up with 60% of the seats. We have to attack all of these problems. But, as Malin said, to do that we have to win. And the way that we win is by not just getting the 47% of voters who we know are angry at Walker and the Republicans and will show up for anyone on this stage as well we should, but we have to get that couple percent of voters and where are we gonna find them? Who are they? They're disaffected progressives who feel like the Democratic Party is no longer speaking to the issues that matter. And that means we have to run a bold, proud progressive, somebody who has a track record of getting things done and isn't afraid to say she's pro-choice and pro-gay rights and pro-health care for all. Number two, we have to attract a couple of the voters who have voted for Walker. And we do that by saying how disappointed we are in his policies, but not denigrating and condescending to the people who voted for him. We have to give them permission to try something new. And we have to give them a candidate who represents the future. And the way we are gonna do it, more than anything, is by passing the torch. We need a candidate to represent the future because elections are about the future. And I represent the future. I'm a member of Generation X. We are facing economic struggles along with our friends, the millennials, that the baby boomers, our parents and our grandparents, do not fully appreciate. And nobody is speaking to these issues. It's about refinancing student loan debt, affordable childcare. These are the issues that are gonna motivate and put us over the top so we can actually get this done and serve the people. Thank you. Based on my record on student loans, on developing starting block in Madison, turning Madison into one of the most advanced cities in the country, uh, where it was unrecognizable in terms of technology 10 years ago. I take exception to saying that a baby boomer uh, doesn't understand those issues. But I also want you to please look at my record on these matters. What did I do as an elected official? For example, when a developer working with the city of Madison sent a donation check to my campaign, I sent it back. When someone who had donated to my campaign unexpectedly started negotiating a contract with the city of Madison, I recused myself and I turned it over to the president of the city council. When I bought stock, exact science stock in 2009, not knowing that I was going to be mayor two years later, bought it at $3 a share, by the way, and, and made a commitment to myself that for once in my life I was never going to sell something. Then I got word that Exact Science wanted to negotiate a development agreement with the city. That day, I sold the stock. I did sell it for a few dollars more than three, but you should know that it's now $43 a share. My point being that when issues have come up in regards to campaign contributions, and my role as a public official. I've recused myself, I've sent money back, and I have divested myself even when it was not in our family's financial interest. That, I think, is a standard which we expect all elected officials and which I would continue to hold if I was governor.
money in politics is is a huge issue in our society. It's a driving issue, and it's a it's an issue that we need to resolve. There's no question about it. I just finished a, a book called The Crisis of the Middle Class Constitution, written by a law professor at Vanderbilt, um, and and. It, went through very carefully all of the republics that, that have existed and how they came to end. And it, it's because of the tension between the uber-rich and everybody else. That tension has gone on for a millennia. And it, it has to be resolved. This Citizens United decision is a scourge on our society. It is a bizarre decision based in part on mistake uh, and, and it has to be resolved, but we're going to have to amend the Constitution to get this done. In the interim, we have to win elections. We absolutely, positively must win elections. I, like Mayor Soglin, I have turned money back that I've gotten from various organizations over the last six years while I've been in the state legislature. I, I very much, um, I do not appreciate some of the, the lobbying efforts that go on in that building. I mean, that building is filled with torrents of water or money that's going to uh, the other side of the aisle. And it, it affects our water, it affects our environment, it affects everything in this society. So we have a problem and what we have to decide at some point is do we want to have a republic? What we have to decide at some point is are we going to have fair election districts? These are the issues before the Supreme Court right now. The, 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 the gerrymandering that's gone on in this society. They've rigged the political system, they've rigged the economic system, and this has got to stop. So our Supreme Court will decide shortly on, on uh, the, the gerrymandering stuff, but we've got to win the election before we can change the rest of it. We're not talking about having a revolution, I assume. I'm certainly not talking about that. We've got to win this election. And research shows that Many of the low information voters, they rely on the last couple of television commercials that they see. So we've got to have enough money to get on television in a meaningful way, or we will lose. And so it's a, it's a combination, really. Thank you. elections, but it doesn't buy voters. The solution is to get people's attention again. But people have given up, right? They, apathy has really created this. Apathy on the part of those who are elected and apathy on the part of those who should be voting. I mean, we need to change our message to better reflect the people. And we can't propose to play or to win this election by playing by the rules of the morally corrupt. Think about it. These people are willing to let people starve and die and suffer to win elections. Is that what you want representing you? No one will fight harder for the people to have a better life than me. There are some things I am not willing to do to win an election. And that might doom me, right? People are like, oh, she doesn't have money. She's not serious. No, I'm serious. But I am not going to play by any of the rules that have caused the apathy. Because people don't think we're listening. And we've lost touch with people. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get out there. I'm going to get people's attention. I'm not going to cheat democracy. I'm going to rely on the voters. I'm going to trust the voters. Because I can't expect voters to trust me if I don't show faith in you. It's all about your choice. And I don't have a political career to ruin. So at the end of the day, if it was me and Scott Walker and people wouldn't know the difference, they might notice the difference this time. Hi everyone, Andy Gorman again. So for those of you who would like to write me a small, medium, or large check, because you know that I'm the candidate 
that is going to beat Scott Walker, the line forms over there when we're done with this event. Because, listen, the bottom line is that money does matter, unfortunately. And each of you, each of you in this room, I know what you want more than anything else. You want to beat Scott Walker. That does take resources. Everybody on this stage has to kick you guys off the bench and get you involved in a very real way to support the campaign that's going to make that happen. Now, we have a broken system. Scott Walker has a playbook to beat establishment Democrats, but he does not have a playbook to beat me. That's the bottom line here, folks. I can't wait to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that man and talk about his open for business Wisconsin that has squeezed our workers statewide, attacked our teachers statewide, and put our health care at risk. But let me tell you who I'm not going to take money from. I'm not going to take money from the NRA. I didn't wait for the most recent slaughter to say that I was banning assault weapons or military-style ammunition or bump stocks or call for common sense solutions without attacking the culture of guns that we have in our state. We are a state that hunts. It's big from a revenue perspective, but there's a huge difference between hunting and gun violence. I'm never going to take a money from the from money from the drug companies that are essentially responsible for the opioid crisis that we have throughout our state and throughout our country. In fact, I'm going to go after them because just like the cigarette companies who told people for decades that cigarettes did not cause cancer, drug companies told their prescribers that opioids were not addictive. We will recover tens of millions of dollars that this state spends every single year from those drug companies. I don't care about those special interests. I don't care about insurance companies that routinely tell people they're covered and then when they have a loss, they don't want to pay them. We're going to make it simple for people to make sure that they're able to recover those things. So I'll take on the special interests, but I will also take on every one of you who wants to write a check. Meet me over there, and we'll take it online too at www.andygronick.com. Thank you. As somebody who's worked on this issue for a long time, I'm convinced that all of you are on the side of the good cause. Uh, I'm going to direct a question to uh, Representative Fox, and because she was in the legislature, to Ms. Rice. Um, it's possible, we, we know, I think we know that a Democrat can win the governorship. I think we know that the legislature is unlikely to go uh, Democrat. Based on what you know from your experience, what can plausibly be done from, by a Democratic governor facing a Republican legislat legislature to limit the effects of <coughs> plutocratic money? <coughs> <laughs> um, here's, I think, what we need to do based on my experience in the legislature and based on 32 years of trying lawsuits. I have fought very hard for my clients in the courtroom. And then I end up often very good friends with the defense attorney that's on the other side or the attorney on the other side of the case. You got to know when to be strong. You got to know when to put your hand up and make friends. Uh, a couple years ago, I worked very hard on a on a complicated uh, bill dealing with structured annuities. I was asked to work on that bill uh, with some Republicans, and we worked all summer to put it together. And the time came for the bill to be signed, and and, and I was in, and everybody showed up at the governor's office, but somebody forgot to invite me. I'm not pointing fingers, but for some reason, I wasn't invited to the governor's office to sign the bill. The other Republican legislators, they insisted that we hold another, another signing session because I wasn't there and they knew the work that I put into this. You gotta build rapport with the folks on the other side. You gotta know when to veto and when to make friends. You gotta take a, a, perhaps a lesson out of Tommy Thompson's playbook in terms of making sure that there's some social relationship between you and the other side. But you've got to show resolve 
you've got to tell them when you're serious. And there, I very much doubt that they'll have enough votes to override vetoes. They got to know we're serious, but they also got to know that we're interested in governing actual policy. And we're going to have policy for regular people, regular folks in this state. That's why I'm in this race. Because right now we've lost our way. We used to have something called the Wisconsin idea. Part of that idea, obviously education was huge in it, but part of that idea was to make sure that the legislation that comes through that building is legislation that benefits the most amount of people possible. Ladies and gentlemen, we need our idea back. That's why I'm in this race. I'm Dana Watts. I'm really proud that throughout my career, I have worked across the aisle when possible. Not just when I was in the legislature. In fact, if you go to my website, uh, keldaforgovernor.com, you can see a video where I talk about one of the things that I'm most proud of, the BPA Free Kids Act, which passed with huge bipartisan support, even though we were one of the first states to stand up to the big chemical companies and stand up for children's health. When I was the head of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin, I worked with some Republicans to pass the first pro-choice legislation in this state in 30 years, the Compassionate Care for Rape Victims Bill, even though the Republicans uh, and an anti-choice majority controlled the state assembly. Even back when I was in law school, I worked with the Innocence Project and helped to pass criminal justice reforms to prevent wrongful convictions so innocent people wouldn't go behind bars, working with some of the most conservative members of the legislature, some of whom are unfortunately now in the judiciary. The point is, absolutely, we can work across party lines if you elect someone with the skills to do it. But let's not confuse ourselves about who we're dealing with. The Republican Party of today has governed, and I use that term with hesitation, in the most radical way, destroying not just the policies that we care about, not just natural resources and public education and health care, but also destroying our sense of community, our sense of pragmatism here in Wisconsin, that you know, not just our progressive tradition, but how we get things done and how we treat each other. And until uh, that changes, we're gonna have a very difficult time getting anything done. So we need a governor who has experience working across the aisle, um, and that means some experience working in state government, but we also need, need someone with the courage to stand up for when it's right and say, this is a line in the sand. We are going to be able to refinance student loan debt in this state. And you, if you take that out of the budget, not a thing is going to happen. So we need a governor with the courage to use her veto pen when it matters, because we understand who we're dealing with on the other side of the aisle. Thank you. Harlow, um, you've uh, pretty much hung your hat from the beginning in entering the race on having novel ideas, uh, no matter what the field. Are there any ideas that we've not heard that do relate, direct, relate directly to campaign finance, campaign expenditures, that you would want to share with us uh, as a new vision? Well, uh, first I would ask, um, sure, I, I can try to talk for two minutes on that, but uh, it might be more productive, because the, the question is very general, and I'm wondering, should I answer a different question, Aaron, or, or would you like me to answer this one? Uh, should, can we wait till a future topic? I mean, I, I could talk for two minutes, but it's a very general question. It's, it's, I didn't think it was general to say, do you have any specific ideas that we have not heard about campaign no, finance? No, I, I understand. And Michael, I, I don't mean to, to suggest it. I'm just wondering uh, if I could do it on a different topic. Two, we're trying to get one, one topic, and so we do a lot of research. Oh, oh, okay, fine, fine, I'll do this. I'll answer. No, no, I'll, I'll do this. This is, this is okay, we'll, we'll do it this way. Um, Yeah, I, the, well, I'll, I'll tell you about how I would go about, as governor, looking at this issue and this topic and making uh, reforms that make our elections more democratic, that hold 
uh, the people of Wisconsin more accountable, or the, the legislature is more accountable to the people of Wisconsin. Uh, I would look at correlations between policy results and a variety of factors that are going in to decision making, money, uh, lobbying, voter turnout, and I would look at our election system whole, holistically. I would have a panel of people look into that, and I would say what are the biggest things that we can do to make meaningful change, and also what things can we reasonably get through the legislature, what things do we have common ground with whatever legislature is there in session to be able to achieve real results during my term as governor, and that is what I would focus on. Uh, the thing that I've spoken about a little bit that I'm very passionate about is having high voter turnout because if you look around the world, the countries that do have high voter turnout have policies that do meaningful things for their constituents. So the countries that have low voter turnout or very low voter turnout, meaning nobody votes, uh, don't have that kind of relationship. So I believe in voter turnout. And I would say, well, we should have more voting by mail. It should be easier to register to vote by mail. You shouldn't have to mail in some ID to be able to be approved for it. You should just say, you know, you are a voter, you should be able to vote by mail. We should have a longer period before elections uh, where people can vote. Uh, we should have uh, more polling places. We should explore technologies to make it easier to vote, electronic uh, technologies. If we can have end-to-end -end encryption uh, where this system could potentially be even more secure and give people more access to be able to vote. Uh, so that would be my focus as governor. I'm Will Stites, and um, my background is in soil science and hydrogeology, groundwater. And I've uh, done some work here with uh, groundwater research at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And I worked in water regulation, regulating waterway and wetland projects for our Department of Natural Resources. So my question focuses on water issues. And central Wisconsin has had severe problems with disappearing lakes and streams and rampant, rampant nitrate pollution in drinking water wells. Other parts of the state also struggle with water depletion, like the city of Waukesha. And uh, there's been hideous groundwater pollution in places like Kiwani County with stinky brown tap water. So I'd like to know what is your plan to restore and manage water quantity and quality in Wisconsin? Yeah, who's first? Mr. Mitchell, you're first. Um, thank you for that question. So we're talking about the environment and the state of Wisconsin, the best thing, one of the best things about this great state is our, our natural resources. Um, first thing I do, and, and, and I'll get to your water question in a minute, but the first thing I, I'll do in regards to our environment is we have to make uh, Wisconsin actually believe in science again. So we, we have to actually... <laughs> and as a governor, you do that by, one, not um, killing the DNR. We need to make sure the DNR is strong. We need to fully staff the DNR, which right now for the last seven or so years it's been not cut 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 under governor walker uh, where we don't it's a, it's a former shell of itself my office downtown for the firefighters association is right down the street from the dnr and when i go in there and actually get my deer hunting license uh, there are no people in there. i mean it's vacant because the dnr essentially is a former shell of itself so we need to make sure we fully staff fully fund the dnr make sure it's not partisan make sure it takes care of our lakes takes care of our streams because that is what's great about our state is the dnr you talk about groundwater, we look at K-Falls, we look at high capacity wells contaminating our groundwater in rural areas. Well, that has effects. Now, people in, in the urban areas may not think that that affects them, but we're all in this together. We may all, all have come over here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So how our state goes is how, to, how our entire, well, the Milwaukee or Madison, we're all in this together. So when you look at Foxconn, which is a sham, which is a scam, that they're able to, to take seven million gallons of water out of Lake Michigan a day. And they say, oh no, don't worry though, we're gonna replace it with the, the same water. We just gotta use some of the water and we're gonna replace it. Well, we know that's a scam, it's a farce. So what the governor can do, and what the governor has to do, one, we have to win. Two, in order to get our lakes and streams and our waterways safe again. We don't wanna be Flint, Michigan. You look at what happens, what's happened in the walk with the laterals and lead, lead water. That is a problem. 
And what we can do, again, is not ease environmental protections for businesses. Businesses got to come in, and we, we, we got to be pro-business, but they got to play by the same rules as the rest of us. They got to be good stewards of our natural resources in order to work here in Wisconsin. So we need to make sure we got a fully funded DNR, make Wisconsin believe in science again, and actually make it nonpartisan. Thanks. I didn't realize that was a question for everyone. Um, Wisconsin actually means, the word Wisconsin means the place of gathering waters. And it is one of the most special things about our state. Uh, you know, Minnesota claims they have 10,000 lakes. We've got 20,000. But they are under threat. And we absolutely do. I agree with Mel. We have to restore the DNR's funding. We have to restore their independence and make sure that science and evidence are how decisions are made and not politics and big money um, so that polluters are escaping any responsibility. We can start with simply enforcing the laws that we have to protect our groundwater, to protect uh, us from runoff and non-point source pollution, and to hold polluters accountable when they do, uh, when they do pollute. We also have to really look at how we are citing CAFOs if we're going to talk about runoff and, and manure. There are mo a lot of places in this state where the geology simply cannot handle, or the watershed cannot handle, the kinds of large operations that are being proposed. Um, and the answer is we just can't permit them. We cannot get our permits. The same goes for high capacity wells. It is not okay to be handing over our liquid treasure our water to private corporations uh, or big business who are then going to make it impossible for the rest of us to drink, to fish, to hunt. Um, we can't be filling in our wetlands. They are part of ecosystems and it's not where you can just, they're not fungible, you just buy one and sell another. If you fill in a wetland, you are destroying that ecosystem and making us more vulnerable to flooding and other kinds of ecological disaster. The DNR used to be used to be a national leader. And it was because of the water quality uh, work that was done here and pioneered here in the state of Aldo Leopold and Gaylord Nelson. We are going to restore an independent DNR that protects all of us and our common natural heritage. On April 22nd, 1970, I spoke at the University of Wisconsin Stock Pavilion in Madison. I joined Senator Mike Gravel and was at the invitation of Gaylord Nelson to address the first Earth Day in Madison. One of the reasons that the Senator had asked me is that on the City Council, I was part of a faction who was opposing the use of Aquathol to clear out the weeds in, in Lake Mendota and Lake Monona. The first thing we have to understand is we are not going to use additional poisons to deal with this weed growth and this uh, growth of algae in our lakes. We have to deal with it from the source. That's why to this day in Madison, we now have an adaptive management plan where we are preventing the phosphorus coming out through the Cherokee Marsh from entering Lake Mendota, eventually Lake Monona, and flowing down the Four Lakes chain to the Rock River. 1997, before I left office, I had the Water Department do a study as to of uh, the lead fixtures in Madison, which eventually was completed after I left office, and led Madison to becoming the first city in the United States to remove lead fixtures from the water system. Something that needs to be done in every city in this state. There cannot be any exposure to lead to our, our, our kids. I also want to point out that in terms of the application of manure, it has to obviously be regulated not just for the nitrates, but for the phosphorus, the cryptosporidium, and all the other things that make it impossible, not just us, but for the wildlife and for the domesticated animals to safely drink that water. The last thing I want to address is salt. There is too much salt being applied to our roads, to private shopping center parking lots. It is getting into the lakes. It has ruined the trout fishing up, up north, and it is endangering uh, our lakes in, in, in the lower part of the state.
about five years ago when I got into the legislature, I, I got into the legislature a few months after the Pinocchio Mine Iron Iron Mining Bill was introduced. And I remember I, I we, my wife and I blew off church on a Super Bowl Sunday that year, and I sat down with the statutes and the administrative code and I started digging through that bill. And pretty quick, I realized that there's a loophole right in that bill that would allow you to drain man-made lakes, flowages, mine the bottom of the man-made lake or flowage, and then refill it later and argue to the courts that there's a difference, functional difference, given the fact that the lake is now 600 feet deep instead of 60 feet deep. I couldn't believe it, because they've been debating this bill for several months. And so I went to Ledge Council, and they confirmed my analysis, and then I thought, now who's, who's, why would they do that? And we went to GIS, Geological Survey, and we found out that mining companies were accessing samples from underneath lakes all over northern Wisconsin that were taken in the 60s and 70s. And they found vanadium underneath a, a lake called a, a tiger cat flowage and under the chippewa flowage. And vanadium's a superconductor. So somebody buried deep in the bottles of K Street put that little loophole in that bill where everybody's looking at the shiny object up in the, in the, in, in, in the Pinocchies and the law's changing statewide. We are up against people that are dangerous and they don't know what they're doing. And they've turned the DNR into nothing more than a permanent, permanent agency. I'm the legislator that wrote the CWD bill to save the deer herd, and I wrote the Save the Lakes bill to try to plug that loophole. We are, we are up against some serious folks, and we've got to look real hard at all the legislation coming into this state. It's flooding into the state from various powerful special interest groups, and you've got to look close because you can miss it. Absolutely, we're going to have an independent DNR. The DNR is, is going to have scientists in it again, and, and we've just got to. I mean, the CAFOs are ruining the water. Uh, the, the high capacity wells are, are outrageously taking aquifer water that I don't even know when you can replace all this. It's just being sprayed, and we've got to get, we've got to get real about this and have an independent DNR. Well, the reality of the situation is no one, no human being can live without water. So, I don't know why we're getting more lax on environmental things in order to um, lure firms into the area. First, the DNR needs to be nonpartisan, obviously. Science is a thing. It's not like just some liberal conspiracy to make you wash out your soda cans before you throw it away. Like, it's a thing. And the factors of production include all resources spent, whether or not it's ruined or utilized. And yet, firms are getting away with taking profit and not being held accountable for that cost. In the terms of a $4 billion check. Thank you very much. So, I'm sorry, but the basic thing is, my cat knows not to, you know, use the litter box where it eats, right? Can we be smarter than that? Like, honestly, you can't convince somebody that, well, the water's only sort of polluted. I mean, we're not allowed to go to war with another country and poison their water. So why are we doing it to our people? We don't have a future. We don't have a sustainable economic future if we waste resources on the pursuit of one thing. We won't survive. Hi, everyone. I'm still Andy Gronick. All right, so we need actual real plans, and we have 30 to 60 seconds to communicate to most people, to convince them that we actually have a plan to move the state of Wisconsin forward and make their life better. We can talk about platitudes all day long, but if you look at my Grow Wisp plan, it's about actual plans that make Wisconsin a global leader around the sustainable technologies and applications for food, water, air, and energy. And if we accomplish that, and we will if I'm your governor, we create jobs in science, technology, manufacturing, and in agriculture. And that's who we are. We have to have a real plan to move forward and solve some of the problems that we have in the state with the kinds of things that we will refine, that we'll invent, and that we'll be able to sell on a worldwide basis that support life everywhere. There's always a lot of conversation uh, about the KFOs. Well, listen, our agricultural industry in the state of Wisconsin represents over $43 billion to this state. Why don't we actually solve the problem? All right, why don't we make sure that the water that goes back on those fields is actually clean irrigation water? And we can do that by refining reverse osmosis. 
Okay, that can be done, that can be done in the state of Wisconsin, and we can return water from that manure to our fields. Why don't we take the technology of that, of, of, uh, of that manure and pipe that gas to centralize power companies and generate power that actually lights up mid-sized communities in the state of Wisconsin? What if we take that nitrogen and actually make fertilizer out of it? Fertilizer out of it? What if we uh, grab those organics and sell them on a nationwide basis? That's all possible. You simply have to respect who we are as a state, advance those technologies and actually make it happen, and have real respect for our environment in the process. It's possible to strike a balance between respecting our environment and creating an environment that allows companies to come here to grow and to create those good paying, family sustaining jobs with benefits that we all need. So let's get real here in this room, okay? Let's talk about real ideas, real plans that actually make living in the state of Wisconsin better, and you'll see those plans on my website at andygronick.com. Start with the Grow With Jobs Plan. Well, what we have is a situation where in this country, uh, one of the wealthiest countries on earth, a country where we have a long-standing democratic tradition and real accountability of the American people for the, our political process. We are seeing uh, residents of Wisconsin, American citizens, having their water quality endangered uh, and being put at risk because we can't get our act together and hold uh, big companies accountable and industries accountable to the extent that we actually protect the quality of our water. That should never be the case. Now, I think the root of the problem is money and politics. It's the way things are done in Washington. Uh, and you have to look at what food really is, what the agricultural sector really is in our economy. Uh, it is a commodity, first of all. Lots of people know how to produce food. Uh, you're never, never going to have high margins with it. And it is vital to our national security. So that being the case, we need to come up with a system that produces good quality, healthy food uh, for our citizens, we need to have a system that uh, has a fair deal for farmers. And uh, we need policies that achieve that. So the, the way the Farm Bill is working is this working only for big uh, special interests, for big agribusiness, destroying our environment and, and hurting farmers in the name of profits, and trying to export more of that product globally, propped up by subsidies, again, at the expense of our environment at the expense of farmers, at the expense of uh, the American people. So what we need to do is find a new system where we are uh, supporting and giving security to farmers in the right way, not as a means to drive corporate prop profits and agribusiness, but as a means to national security and as a means to health as a nation. Probably the two greatest honors I've ever received in my life. One goes back to 2004, the Clean Water Action Council named me its Environmental Advocate of the Year. And much more recently in 2015, the Wisconsin Farmers Union gave me its Friend of the Family Farmer Award. And the two are tied uh, because the way we practice agriculture has everything to do with, with the condition of our environment. Look, in Wisconsin, nobody anywhere should turn on a water faucet and be afraid to drink what comes up. And there are too many people who cannot turn on a water faucet and, and safely drink what comes out of that tap. And nobody should be able to hog so much water that it dries up the neighbor's wells or dries up lakes and streams. And to get to that Wisconsin, we first of all have to restore independence to the Department of Natural Resources. I've long taken the position that the DNR secretary should be appointed by the Natural Resources Board and not the governor. I would stick to that position as governor. We need to restore independence to the DNR. We need to bring back the scientists. We need to change the mentality in that agency that has it currently scrubbing the, any mention of climate change from its own website. We need to change the mentality in that agency that, that has them allowing polluters to write their own pollution permits. The second thing we need to do after restoring that independence and bringing back science to the DNR 
is destroying local democracy. 130 laws have been passed taking away local decision-making authority from communities. And, and so much of it affects water, our, our land, and our air. And you know, we need to allow local communities to have say over the sinking of high-capacity wells or the siting of these massive industrial feedlots. And the third thing we need to do is change our approach, our philosophy to agriculture. I grew up on a family farm. Our state is on the side of subsidizing the massive industrialization of agriculture. We need to put it on the side of incentivizing, actively incentivizing, small-scale, sustainable agriculture. And the follow-up question is that uh, a number of your candidates have emphasized that we need to restore... Hmm? Okay, okay. First, I'm supposed to say that um, the question is directed to Mr. Soglin first, then Ms. Doolin, and then Mr. Gronick. Okay, so the question is, a number of you have talked about the need to restore independence to the DNR. And we've certainly seen under the current administration tremendous politicization and <coughs> centralization of power in the governor's office. Um, with respect to the DNR and other agencies. So I'd like to know how would you restore independence to the DNR and does this uh, concept apply to any other state agencies? Mr. Sagan? Well, let's stay with the, the DNR for the moment. Um, I, would, I, would I would refer it back to what it was 20 years ago in terms of structure. That's, that's the first thing, independent DNR which is responsible in effect to the people of the state. Uh, as part of that, I would send a letter to Tia Nelson and tell her that she could utter the words climate change and global warming and be welcome back to the state of Wisconsin where she belongs and where we need her work. The problems go beyond the DNR. One of the things that was characteristic of both Republican and Democratic administrations in the state for a long period of time was the appointment of people not based on ideology, but based on thoughtfulness in regards to the Public Service Commission. I wouldn't change the structure of the Public Service Commission, but I would certainly change the type of persons, people, who were appointed to serve in that capacity because their regulatory authority, which not, is, is not limited just to the energy companies, but is also uh, subject, uh, the, the power is subject to water utilities, for example, is, is something that needs additional scrutiny in, in the state of Wisconsin. The problem is, none of this is going to be solved without the effective leadership coming from the governor's office. It's got to be a governor who makes it very clear to the agencies and to the staffs that we want decisions made based on science, free of corporate influence, and that, if, by the way, as a footnote, corporations are not people. Um, they, they don't breathe, and they don't drink the water and breathe the air that we breathe. And so I would focus in, in, in that area in setting a tone as to how government's to be administered. Now one of the destructive things that Scott Walker has done is he's basically put political hacks in many key jobs. And that means we have to restore civil service throughout state government. So the question was about um, what, I, what I would do as governor to restore the DNR and to kind of reset things um, from the current administration. And I think I'm going to go a little, a little differently here. Um, one of the things we can't do right now is approach it, run it over, and approach things with facts. I mean, we've noticed now we're kind of in a post-fact society. People think the world is flat and they disregard science. And I mean, you can think a candidate, you know, a candidate can be harmful and evil and then still win an election because he made them feel better. So we have to understand that what's important to one person might not necessarily be important to another. So instead of 
hitting it over and you know, I definitely think we need science to prevail. That's, I mean, those are facts. But we need to, the reality is, we need to show people the reality. We need to make problems relatable to the people we're talking to. So if you want to save the water, if you want to save water, or if you want to save um, the North Woods, then talk to people, ask questions, find common ground, make it, make them understand that you understand what's important to them, and then they'll be willing to work with you. Because there's a trust issue right now. I mean, they're kind of like, well, we'll disband this and we'll disband that, because people don't trust government right now which is why they're not voting. So we need to have restore the government's relationship with the voters. And then care to have people understand that we have their best interests in mind, but still be the adult in the room. Hi, everyone. Hey, Andy Grover. All right, so there's a lot of reasons why people used to come to the state of Wisconsin, right? Good paying jobs, great education, and one heck of an environment, right? So why wouldn't we want a really strong, independent DNR? Because I definitely do. But we have a, we have a, a governor right now that has traded for a few, the high capacity wells, okay? He's negotiating on behalf of a lot of people instead of the people of Wisconsin. He's eliminating wetlands. He granted Foxconn access to 7 million gallons per day and didn't have the common sense to actually go to a Foxconn plant, take a sample out of their effluent treatment uh, uh, operation, and find out what kind of heavy metals were actually going in or will be going into our Great Lake Michigan. He, uh, he makes uh, some of the rules uh, less stringent for people who want to make lead, okay, and what the penalties might be for those folks. This is a governor who's selling our parklands uh, he's negotiating with iron mines and doesn't want to put regulations in place for sand mines. So I definitely want a strong DNR, and I'll tell you who else does. The companies who are in the state of Wisconsin. I traveled the state for 18 months. I talked to people who were manufacturers, who were processors, you name it, as well as the people that I want to determine whether or not these jobs plans actually made sense. When you have a weekday DNR, there is no predictability what exactly it's going to be to go and get yourself permitted. People want that predictability. They want to understand what's going to be expected by the state of Wisconsin. By having a strong DNR, you actually accomplish that. You know who else wants a strong DNR? Hunters. Because they don't want to bring down a deer and find that that deer has chronic wasting disease. You know who else wants it? People who fish. Anybody fish in this room? Okay, we want to make sure that those streams and those lakes are actually have fish. You know who else wants it? Duck hunters. They want to make sure that that marshland stays, that habitat stays there. A strong DNR is in every one of our benefits. And I know my time is up, but I want to also say this. A strong DNR working in partnership will take on that lead lateral issue that we've had in this state forever. There's 38 communities right now participating in Governor Walker's $14.5 million program on something that's going to cost more than a half a billion dollars to take care of. And we're poisoning our kids in this state, and there is no cure for lead blood levels that are high. Okay, thank you all. That will conclude the interview portion of the night. Now I know there is only so much time to ask so many questions, and I know that there are probably other things that you would like to know from it, these candidates. However, we do have the room until 9 o'clock tonight, so we will be asking the candidates to stick around to continue this conversation. Before I wrap it up, I would like to let everyone know that the next Portage County chapter of our Wisconsin Revolution is meeting on April 12th. That is a Thursday night at 7 p.m. We typically meet at MEJs, however, since we are a growing group at this time, we will be at Mid-State Tech College in the Community Engagement Room, that is Mid-State Room 365. And a nice bonus to that is that uh, whatever was not asked tonight, there have been some uh, questions that have been written by community members, and you will have the written responses from these candidates. 
So, with that being said, first and foremost, on behalf of the Revolution, I would like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and making this possible. I would like to thank these candidates for coming in here to Portage County to speak with us. I would like to thank the organizers of this group, our Wisconsin Revolution, the Wisconsin Choice Project, Working Families Party, and the UWSP Women's Resource Center. And last but not least, I would really like to thank those who came out to the town hall on January 23rd to help put together these questions and make your voices heard. Ladies and gentlemen, the revolution is happening. You cannot stop it, so let's keep this thing going. Thank you.